Um, my earliest memories have to be my, from my mother making pots. She was a potter and the clay was there and we'd, my sisters and me all would play with the clay and uh, I tended to uh, want to make figurines because I had a, a need to show how I felt through figurines to explain to people, to communicate, to communicate how I felt, what was going on in my life, what I saw around me. And it just kept going, kept continuing. I think that the, the clowns are, are these beings that want to show the world what they are doing, not themselves, but the world. They're, they're reflections. They're, they're mirrors of the world. And, um, and it became very obvious to me that I was doing the same thing. I was creating these figures, and I wasn't going out there and doing it through my own body, but I was using these figurines to do the same thing they were doing through them. And I was a mirror to the world through my sculptures. And then people could look at them, hopefully, and say, I know that in me, and maybe they'll learn something. And the clowns were all about, you know, trying to teach people to be uh, more conscious beings, to be more aware of what they were up to, what they were doing. Everything in the Pueblo world is sacred, so the clowns have to be sacred too. They're sacred beings, and so they they clown in a sacred manner, whereas I think in Western culture, because nothing is sacred, the clowns goof off, goof around just for fun. But if you have everything being sacred, then you goof around sacredly. You do it for a reason. You do it because there's something important to say, and everything you do matters. And so their goofing isn't to pass time or just make people laugh. It's a learning. It's to teach the world something. I think I'm one of these people that love to watch people. I study people and I study people and I uh, feel them inside me. And I w I've been able to take that all in and it comes out of me in these pieces to hopefully show them what I see after having picked it up from everywhere around me. For a while, for a long time now, about 10 years now, seems like I've been into really thinking about women and what women are about in the whole scene of the world and trying to portray how women have been seen and what women really do feel like to me and trying very hard to like get that feeling across through the pieces so that when people see her, they feel her in a place that isn't judged, isn't, isn't um, the typical ideals of women so that there can be a deeper understanding of who we as women are instead of what has been placed on us. And that's a big theme for me, and it keeps going, and I learn from it. It's like it's, a, it's an evolving process. It doesn't ever stop. You know, the woman who's part bowl, and she has a spoon in there, <laughs> she's stirring her belly, basically, and she doesn't look too happy. But that's, a, that's an early piece that I did, gosh, about 10 years ago, that uh, that I didn't have it real clear in my mind. I just knew something about this, about women feels like this, you know, and it's, it's um, there's something stirring in her and she is like a bull. And then that kind of kept going and I start to realize there's all kinds of symbols in the Pueblo mythology and stuff that that are about the bull and the mother. And it was like, oh, I understand why I felt this. I understand why I felt her as a bull. And, and, and there was a lot of pain there because I felt like that meaning or the sacredness of her is lost so that she just becomes 
a utilitarian object. Uh, I, I'm, I'm very caught by how all these containers in the world now are disposable. It's like plastic containers. They're all the female, but they're all, the containers aren't important anymore. And they're just used and used up. And so I started to like realize that my sense of what I had gotten there really did connect to a lot of the old um, beliefs of women, all the things about what women were seen as. But um, as I started to, to go into it, I realized that I needed to give that importance more than just express that state, but to give and show that it's beautiful, that it's a good thing, it's not something to use up and throw away or to not notice. And um, then that other piece came later that's a little more just kind of into herself. <laughs> She's called I Am a Bowl Woman to, because they, all women are bowls and that uh, and that it's important that we, as women, feel how we are bowls, that we are these containers that are um, full of life, or full of emptiness, or full of pain, or full of, it's like we hold enormous amount of things in us as women. And um, I liked her because it's just like this feeling of, when I felt her, it's like how my body, hangs down in my bowl and her breasts hang inside this bowl and she's just holding her bowl and uh, it just feels like how I feel <laughs> and it's and, and and not seeing it as a bad thing but seeing it as something that feels good instead of hi I'm a girl instead of no I'm a bowl it's a very different feeling than ideals of women sure. well the thing about the bowls and and the way that earth is seen, the earth is seen as a bowl. And, um, and it's funny because you go, well, the earth is a round ball, but not really, not in our experience of it, because in our experience of it, we're in her. And the mountains are around us and we're in the valleys and we're in this bowl. We don't experience being on this ball. We experience being in a bowl, and so the idea of the earth being a bowl makes a lot more sense. And then it's like we have a sky over us, so it's like then it creates the sphere that then gets seen as a whole universe, but, um, but we're in it, we're not on top of it. <laughs> it's so cold to be on top of this ball, um, and that's a very female feeling to be in this bowl. And, and then there's the whole things of rings, rings of, uh, of all the sacred points, which is defining our universe. And it can start from us. It's like, here's me. Here's the center of the world. I'm the center of the world. So are you. So is everybody. And then we have our rings that go out from us further and further that create our whole world, which is then our bowl. And so the Pueblos symbolized all that in the making of their whole world. So you have in the middle of their plaza, the center of the world, inside the kiva, the center of the kiva, and it goes out and then you have the ring of buildings and then from there you have the first layer of hills and there'll be shrines on that and then the next layer and the next layer until it defines their world in their bowl, which is then the bowl. Well, I grew up doing adobe work, building houses, plastering with mud, and that's a very easy material to use because I'm used to playing with mud, I'm used to playing in clay. It's very, it's a, it feels good. It's a good material to work in. And so doing adobes is just like playing with clay. It's just making a big pot to live in. So coming here to Santa Clara and building a house in that whole sense of the world makes complete sense. You don't think about it. It just is, makes sense. Growing up, we used to always um, uh, 
help my grandma fix things. <laughs> so it's, I want to say it starts with her. It's like, well, she wants an addition to her house, so we would all go and build her an addition. And then it's like we, it was, it was a very common thing to just fix your houses and add on and take off, and you need to keep plastering. And back then, you know, they didn't have uh, uh, that cement, the cement plaster, so people had to plaster a lot. And so people gathered all the time, making mud and plastering. So it was just a common thing to do. And when I was growing up and built a house with my parents and my family, it was, it wasn't unusual, because that's what you do. <laughs> now it seems unusual, but that's sad. I went uh, to Portland, Oregon, in, in Oregon, to an art school called um, Portland Museum Art School and it was a regular art school that uh, was right downtown Portland and I went there with my mom and we found a little apartment room and I lived in the middle of a city and I was amazed. For, I, I went around looking at houses, all these like look like gingerbread houses everywhere and it's like it wasn't mud, <laughs> it wasn't adobes, it wasn't, you couldn't scoop up a handful and put it back on the wall. It was all these very precise angles and cuts and stuff. It was um, kind of intimidating because it didn't feel like I could do that just with what was right there on, my, on the ground. <laughs> and, uh, and being in the city, It was frightening because it was like everybody locked their doors. Everybody was scared to walk down the streets. You'd hear screams in the night, and I would get terrified. Like, isn't anyone gonna go help them? But I said, Oh no! Everyone has to keep behind their doors. It was a whole different experience. Where I grew up, we never ever locked our house and our car doors and nothing. It was like I did. I still don't know how to use a key very well indoors because it's very unfamiliar. <laughs> But that was a familiar thing to them. And then the art school is, um, was really focused on ideals of art. And that's just like very foreign to what I grew up doing, which was everything you did, including your artwork, whatever you did was just part of your whole life. And that was one expression of it. And um, to separate it like that, was mind-boggling to me. I would, I, I couldn't understand it. I'd go to school and I'd see all these people on the way to school, and um, and I wanted to express what I saw. But no, no, we have to express compositions and colors and things. It's like, but I saw a man without no food, and I saw people walking without a home, and we gotta tell about that. It's like. I couldn't deal with that. That doesn't make sense. You don't make art that doesn't mean anything, that doesn't tell about what's going on. And I couldn't. I, I left and I came home. Uh, I think it's everything <laughs> around me. It's like, well, there was an artistic community in Portland even, but it was the bums on the street and Safeway and that building across the street. It was, it's more like, you no, know, my community is all the things that that I so keen, and here, here it makes sense. It's like people don't think it's strange that you are an artist, because all of them are. If you want to call them artists, it's more like, well, that's what we do. And um, and no, I don't have like an art group I gather with and discuss art with. Or I mean, that would be very strange. <laughs> I have galleries I show in. I have, um, people will come here to see them. Um, sometimes I'll put shows on myself at my mom's house. <laughs> and, uh, um, and Indian Market is a big outlet. Just ways like that. Pressures. Um, for instance, I get um, phone calls or little things in the mail that say, 
orders, orders for a piece. I would like the same clown that you had in this poster but in blue because it'll match my furniture. Um, things like that. I get pressures of like, oh, you're the one that makes clowns, period. You know, it's like trying to push me into the clown maker. Um, I've gone to shows where my pieces will be up and, and um, they'll, the people will be wondering who made these and they'll and someone will point me out and they say her and, and, and then they'll come over and it's like oh a nice little Indian girl <laughs> that sort of thing where it's like first of all I'm not a man so how could you make sculptures because <laughs> sculptures go with men somehow and that you're an Indian and a girl means you're a little Indian girl this sort of thing and and there's just like there's this gap there's this gap of like no you don't understand you don't understand and how do I be understood or should I just go away and hide because there's always this thing of feeling misinterpreted and I think that um I think I've been struggling a long time too because I want to communicate that's what my pieces are about it's like a, co a way of communicating and if I can't communicate the thing I want to communicate, then um, that's my life. I, I, I have to keep trying to find a way to reach the other side. And, and I think it's still a process I'm working on. Because I'm still, you know, it'll go every which way. My Uncle Mike, he's a uh, Michael Naranjo, he was blinded when I was a little kid in the Vietnam War, I remember him going off to war. He came over to the house to say goodbye. I remember sitting on his lap. And the next time I saw him, he couldn't see anymore. And uh, But the thing about my Uncle Mike is that he, he never stopped being himself and figuring out a way to do what he could do given what he had. And even though he didn't have his eyesight and his right hand anymore, he um, he became a sculptor. <laughs> and to me, that's like a big inspiration in itself, just to say, you can do it. <laughs> if I can do it, you can do it. And um, and that he had to do things by feeling, and he did things a lot by just touching and feeling. And to me, I I think I translate that as he lives in a world. A feeling. I also live in a place of feeling, but it's emotional. And so we deal both in the world of feeling. And so I like I like my Uncle Mike and I think he's good. <laughs> I came back home and I and I uh um didn't have anywhere to live at the time. I was living in an aunt's house and then that didn't work out and um I came up here because I have an aunt that lives next door and she said uh, come live in the shed that was right there and it um, was a little old shed there so I moved in with my two children at the time and um, and this was the place that I had to do some and it belonged to my grandparents and my grandparents said build your house and that's exactly what I needed because I didn't have a house so um, I knew what kind of house I wanted already, and um, I wanted I wanted a house like this. Describe <laughs> it. What, 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 what? Well, I had just come back from living in Mora for two years, and there's these old adobe Spanish houses in through the hills that are all falling down. But I really wanted one. I wanted to fix one up and make it a house. So I knew that I wanted a house like one of those because I liked how they looked. Yeah. So I um, started building me one, but I also knew that I wanted it solar because I grew up building solar houses with my parents and I thought it was crazy to live in the Southwest and not have solar. And so I designed a house that was a pitched roof, dormer, windowed, adobe house that's solar. And that's what I made me. 
And I always laugh because people say, well, did you draw out plans and stuff? No, I came out here one morning out of the shed in my pajamas, and I had a stick, and I drew it on the ground. <laughs> and that was my floor plans. Well, I mean, I drew it on the ground, and I just looked at how it felt. Like, did this feel like a good-sized room? And I knew I wanted a big kitchen because I hated little kitchens that you couldn't do anything in. And so the biggest room was the kitchen, and everything else sort of got designed around that, the main big room. I didn't make the adobes myself. There's people close by that make the adobes, so I bought them to save the time. It's like a lot of time. And I sold my sculptures and made money. And when I made money, I would buy more adobes or whatever. And um, I mean, like for the foundation, I had my ex-husband and my mom here to help us, help me lay the foundation. And we called in the trucks and they came and poured the cement and then we played in the cement for a day and it was done. And then like at different times doing the walls, um, I had different people come help. I remember my Aunt Tessie and my mom coming over one day and help hauling adobes. I had hired my uh, ex-husband for a while to help do, you know, heavy stuff that needed two people and help framing the windows and things like that. But I remember many days just, you know, me and the kids just being around and putting them to sleep and coming out and laying some bricks for the day and then go feed them lunch and then come back out and put more adobes down and it just kind of slowly happened and it slowly went up. I needed a home and I knew that I could make one if I just did it little bit by little bit. I think if I thought of it all at once, I couldn't handle it. But I knew I could go get a truckload of dirt and I knew I could mix a wheelbarrow of mud and I knew I could make lunch and then go back and put some more mud down. It's like at that level, I could do it. The whole thing is too scary. So it's like, yeah, I can do that, and I can do that much. Um, by the time we roofed it, it was, I want to say a year, a year, about a year. And then the finishing work just kind of drags on ever since. <laughs> when I met Joel, my husband now, and I met him when it was up to the second story, and he helped me put the roof on and all that part on, which was which was a big job. I remember him and me pulling our our bed up to the second roof, and we had to supply wood on the roof in that spot. And we, whenever it rained, we moved the bed around that plywood so that wherever the direction of the rain was coming. But I felt like, wow, we're in a house, <laughs> even if it was under one plywood. And that felt amazing. I also think of when uh, we were plastering the outside of the house for the first time because that was like the first putting it all together because the plaster combines the whole thing, makes it look like one piece. And we got a whole bunch of people from the family came that one day and we plastered the whole outside of the house in one day. And to me that was a big moment. It was like, we did it. We did it. It's there. And um, and that people came to help, that was nice. <laughs> mm -hmm. And how was it for the kids to help you? Um, well, they were they were pretty little then. They played in the mud. They like um, they couldn't lift a brick, but they they were there and roaming in and out of the walls and playing around. To me, it was like they were important because it was their house. I was making them a house. And even if they didn't realize it, Mama was making a big nest for them to be in because we were tired of not having a home. So they were real inspirational. <laughs> Next step for sure was a yard. Next step was with I mean, I love to make gardens everywhere I've gone. I've made gardens, but um, Joel sort of like put that piece together. And Joel, my husband, he's he's into 
um, into permaculture, which is about integrating what you eat, the food, everything you do, so that you work in a big system, so it's not, it's a sustainable system. And so he started to grow things in the yard, and we kept growing things in the yard, and it became just this big, complex place of animals and plants and people and house and projects and I tend to think that the traditional stuff is intuitive and the permacultural stuff is making the intuitive stuff conscious and so they go together really well for me in that all of a sudden this permaculture thinking made light of what I knew intuitively already and it was like the next step it's like okay we I know all these things but to all of a sudden put it into words or put it into a way you could think it too was broadening I mean people here have have always you know, traditionally they they were permaculturists. <laughs> they grew their own food. They survived on the land. They were part of the whole place, and um, and that's what the permaculturists are trying to do now. Well, when I think of when I think of um, um, the traditional sort of symbols that are symbols of patterns in the world around us, I, um, they help me to see that, that all of it is a kind of flow, that it's flowing, that, that there's these patterns that flow through everything. I think that, um, that, that what people knew intuitively before, I'm trying to now show that it is, can go into the next state of the conscious awareness of theirs being patterns and I think that's why a lot of the symbols have been sort of lost the meaning of it they become cliche or oh that's a nice Indian design or it's a nice but it's like well where did that originally come from it came from a sense of the world through pattern a pattern understanding an understanding that um that there's a flow about the world, the world moves in certain ways that make things work the way they do. And if you can understand those certain flows, you'll be able to move through the world in a harmonious, sacred manner. It's like that's what that meaning is about. It's like being aware of the way the world flows in these patterns because what happens is we go, we want that over there and we try to get to it. It's taking no awareness of how things move and work in this world because if you did, it would flow easier. Your life would be easier. And I think the struggles we have today in modern life or whatever is because we don't aren't aware of those patterns anymore. And so we are always up against the flow of the world. It's like if the grain and the water is going this way, and we're going this way, it's going to be, there's going to be a lot of conflicts in the world, and that's all we see now, just conflicts. But it's like, well, if you are aware of how things work and move, and you move according to that, you walk careful through the world, and it's not conflicting. It just sort of makes sense. When, when you're kind of going about, it's like the more I can follow what intuitively makes sense, which is following the patterns of the world, school is very stiff and rigid and like this, and the world doesn't work like this. It works like, well, today we are going to do this, and it, and, and it changes, and, and it's rainy today, so it's like, but school, it doesn't stop, you know, it, everything has to form around that. So homeschooling or growing your food or making pots or making bread or making whatever we're doing happens to be because of that day. It's, it's moving with that and, and 
to have my kids in school would be so so against the flow of life for me that uh, having them home just makes sense <laughs> mm -hmm. and it works and they learn and they it works so it's not hard it's not like I'm juggling too many things it's like no to put them in school would be hard to have them home is easy well we wanted to make a newsletter we were fed up trying to put articles in other people's newsletters and them editing it and them changing it and putting it into a form that to me felt dry and stiff and to me it was like no we're people I misspell I don't always say the right way but I have a way of saying and that is my flow that is my way of moving in the world and that to me is what makes the world rich so I wanted a newsletter that that was more the way we do things and so Joel knowing so much about plants and all kinds of different information I was going to just intertwine that in and and it's like and and the things that matter to me that I really would like to share I wrote in and the kids put their part in which are hits <laughs> Porter's column has been the uh, hot spot of the newsletter and uh, and it was made for the community here and so we went from door to door putting it in people's hands and it was scary but uh, people like it and they you know they wait for the next issue and and I think part of the reason it's liked is because it is on a human scale it's not technically tight that story came from my grandma and we have a lot of grasshopper problems here and some of the things we want to address in the newsletter is just different ways to deal with like like past problems like grasshopper problems and and basically trying to find different ways to to look at grasshoppers instead of saying oh these bad things let's spray some pesticide on it um, my grandma uh, once told a story of how she um, her way of dealing with the grasshoppers was to scold them and she um, hung them on a clothesline one day. She caught a few of them and hung them up so that they weren't dead. She just hung them up so they couldn't get away and she scolded them and she left them there all day. And she really told them off and told them, if you eat my plants anymore, I will have to hang you up for longer or I'll kill you. And you go back and you tell your relatives that I will catch them and put them on the clothesline too. And so then she unpinned them after her scolding and let them go. And what caught me about that is like, it's a different way of seeing the world that, that those grasshoppers did go home and tell their relatives. And she was proud to say she, her plants didn't get as eaten after that because of the scolding. And it's like, um, that's part of the world that, that sees everything as important, that the grasshoppers are there for a reason. And, uh, and not to put them up as some god, but that like children, they need to be scolded and told when to behave too, because they get naughty. And uh, and uh, you know, just trying to show a different way of seeing the world. What? I want to say, go bring it back to the bull. It's like being a bull and all. <laughs> you're the center of the world, and being the center of the world, you're very important. And uh, and I know my mother always made me feel like um, you can do it, what you want, go do it. You can do it. You're capable. And uh, and a kind of confidence and trust. It's like n encouragement instead of going, you don't do that right. Give it to me. You don't do that. You know, it's like, oh, look how you did it instead, or like. Wow, you're good. There's um and not to set sort of such rigid guidelines of how things are supposed to be done, but to know that each person has a unique thing about them and to be able to look at a person and go, "Ah, you know, you're middle of the world. You're the center of the world. What do you see from where you are?" What do you have to give to the world, given where you are? And it's going to be different than everybody else. Instead of going, 
this is the goal, everyone has to fight for it. It's like, there is no one goal. It's like, all of us are the center of the world, so we all have our thing to do where we are. And I think that gives a great sense of being. Like you exist, and you exist for a reason, and it's up to you to show why, <laughs> given who you are. Manifest yourself. See what it comes out to be. Whereas I think, I want to say, Western thought is like, these are the ways you're supposed to be, and there's a list, and you're supposed to fit one of these, or else you're a failure, or, you've, or you're just a loser in the game. But it's like, no, there is no list. There's only us. So show us who you are.